All right. Well, welcome to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project webinar, um, Considerations for Late Summer Forage Seeding with Sid Bosworth. A few logistics before we get started. Um, if you haven't already, uh, go through the audio setup wizard under Tools. Um, it will greatly improve your audio quality uh, during the webinar. Also, your mic is going to be muted during the presentation, so please use that chat box to type any questions as we go along, and we'll uh, get to those um, during the presentation and afterwards. And also, if you'd like follow-up information, go ahead and enter your email address into the chat box, um, and we'll send that along to you after the presentation. So our presenter today is Sid Bosworth. Um, he is going to uh, take over now, now and share his knowledge with us. Thank you very much, Sid. Thank you, Jesse. So um, tonight's talk is on late summer seedings. And I thought that July is a good time to think about that. We have about a month to, to be uh, doing some planning uh, if we're thinking about seeding down either a hay crop or a, or a pasture next year. Um, I, I think there are many um, advantages to a late summer seeding. Uh, one being there, there is time to do some preparation work, uh, oftentimes with a little better weather condition to prepare a site. Uh, probably one of the big advantages is that you can seed the forages and have a relatively clean field, uh, much more weed free compared to a stream seeding. And that's because many of the summer annual weeds that come in with the seeding um, are oftentimes uh, cued to germinate in the uh, spring and early summer. Whereas in this, this time of year, or especially in August or early September, um, they're a lot less likely to germinate and start growing. So a, a big advantage. Um, the, the other uh, advantage is that you're, as these plants are, are seeded, they're really about to go into a season that they really uh, grow well in. Um, we're going into the fall where the temperatures are uh, cooler. We're getting cooler nights, uh, usually adequate moisture. And uh, most of our pasture and hay crops are cool season species, so they really uh, do well this time of year and, and can grow very, very rapidly. This picture was taken a few years ago. Uh, this is a, um, actually it was an early September seeding, a, a little later than I prefer. And uh, this is a picture of the field just two weeks later, uh, getting good germination and uh, good, uh, good cover with, with the uh, different mixtures that we were planting there. Uh, one thing I, I would like to emphasize is the word late summer seeding rather than fall seeding. Um, most of our forage uh, seed or most of our forage plants need about six to eight weeks of growth before they go into the winter time. So it really is important in our climate in Vermont to think about, about more of an August seeding rather than a, a fall seeding. Um, some of our pasture mixtures may do OK with, with, uh, when seeded in early September. But once we get past the uh, middle of September, I, I think it's really pushing it um, to, to seed and, and uh, uh, be assured of a, of a good uh, stand through the winter. Uh, this is a picture of some pasture mixtures that um, we planted a few years ago in a study. And this picture was taken in Randolph, Vermont. And I just wanted to show another illustration of a, of a late summer seeding. Uh, this stand was seeded in, uh, I think it was August the 25th. No, there it is, August the 22nd. And this picture was taken um, in the first week of October. And it, it just illustrates, too, that you can get a good stand. And one of the other advantages of a late summer seeding is that provided you get a good stand, um, it'll go through the winter and then come back and you'll get really a, a, the benefits of a full harvest year the next year. You should get adequate production as if it's a full, uh, a full um, harvest uh, production year. 
So whether it's a late summer or a spring seeding, um, I think certainly I like to have some goals in mind for what I consider a successful establishment. Um, and, and certainly the first is that the stand is thick enough and weed free that it's going to be uh, achieve optimum productivity for the life of the stand. And if, when you're assessing a new seeding, uh, once the plants are up, these are some average figures for, uh, for uh, assessing that stand. If it's primarily an alfalfa or red clover stand, you know, we want somewhere between 45 and uh, 60 uh, plants um, per, per square foot. A mixed stand of grasses, uh, predominantly grasses, it's gonna, we're going to need more, probably more like um, 60 to 90 uh, seedlings per square foot. Uh, certainly another key to a successful stand is that we get quick cover uh, with minimum impact on erosion. And a late summer seeding um, can be risky just like a spring seeding. Uh, sometimes we do get uh, thunder showers in, in uh, August that might cause sudden uh, erosion. Um, and perhaps one of the downsides of a late summer seeding is that we usually don't add a companion crop, something like a small grain, uh, because it's just too, uh, too competitive with the forage seeding this time of year. And, and a third key, I think, is that for the legumes in the stand, uh, we want good nodulation. Um, these nodules are important for um, nitrogen fixation uh, of the legumes, which is going to be very important in uh, both uh, feeding the legume, but also really feeding the whole stand with uh, uh, nitrogen uh, for the stand of the, of the crop. So I, I just want to go through some of the steps, and again, these principles apply whether it's a late summer seeding or a spring seeding, but I'll put focus on, uh, on this being a late summer seeding. Um, I like to break establishment down into kind of four uh, phases or, or sections. We have a preparation phase, which is very important, um, a seedbed uh, preparation phase, uh, getting close to seeding time, the actual seeding, and then some post-seeding management. And I'll try to address aspects of this uh, over the next uh, uh, the next uh, 40 minutes here, uh, 45, 50 minutes as, as I speak. Just a little bit on preparation phase. Um, this can actually be anywhere from one to two years before the actual seeding, if, if we think about it. This is uh, the phase that includes planning. Uh, and planning could be uh, variety selection. Um, it also involves site selection sometimes, or you, if you know your site, certainly site evaluation, and uh, site correction, uh, if need be. So it, it, uh, after I go through this, uh, if you're thinking of a uh, late summer seeding this year, you may or may not decide uh, whether you want to complete that this year or, or go through some preparation and, and uh, achieve it um, a year from now. Um, but we'll, we'll, we can discuss that. Um, so in site evaluation, certainly it's good to know your soil type and texture. Uh, you can get that information uh, from a soil map, uh, either through your uh, local NRCS office, um, or you can go online through uh, their web page. Uh, there is an interactive soil map. Um, that's pretty handy to find. I am going to show you uh, my website in a minute, and um, I can show you a link to that site. Uh, it's good to know the slope, uh, any wet areas, or uh, when I say dead spots, this might be uh, if it's in a previous crop, you know, is there any problem areas, uh, brush, perennial weeds, all these things should be considered well in advance in case you do need to uh, make any corrections. Um, by now, I hope that 
uh, you've taken a soil test of this field and determined if it has any uh, fertility or lime needs uh, if you're going to be seeding uh, this summer. Um, if not, I would take one as soon as possible. It usually takes one to two weeks to get your soil test results back. And so there would be time to make some corrections. Um, if, if, um, if you're going to be seeding, let's say, in, in mid-August. Um, sometimes the previous crop is something to consider. Um, you know, what, what was grown there? Um, what was the uh, condition of that crop? One concern we sometimes have is herbicide carryover. If you have a field that uh, either you've been using or you've been renting out and it was in corn uh, last year, um, you may want to find out what was applied, if there was any herbicide applied, and uh, check the label for any potential uh, carryover effect. Uh, again, an advantage of a late summer seeding this year might be that you've gone well past the uh, residual period to, to have a concern. Uh, but certainly something to check into. So um, I think I've already commented um, on site correction. Um, uh, again, I think uh, these are some things to, to uh, add to it. Uh, one comment I'll make on lime, if, if your soil test does show a lime requirement, um, I would get that out and mix into your soil as soon as possible. Uh, it's usually best to apply it, you know, six months before seeding, uh, particularly if you're going to have alfalfa in that mixture. Uh, but, um, but you know, uh, at least getting it in the soil and mixed in uh, before seeding is, is going to be to an advantage. And then, of course, during this preparation phase, you're going to be thinking about what mixture you want to uh, plant. Um, and choosing the right mixture is, is very important uh, if you're going to optimize your production and, and quality. And there's a lot of factors there that go into uh, what kinds of species you want to grow, uh, depending on um, your soil type, uh, your usage. Is it going to be for uh, used primarily for hay or for pasture or a combination? Um, or, or is it going to be uh, chopped for haylage? Um, what's your quality goals? Um, you know, some, some forages can be cut more often than others and therefore achieve a, a potentially higher quality. So all these things uh, certainly need to be considered. Um, with this slide, though, I just want to emphasize that mixtures, I think, are, are very beneficial. And at least the minimum is, is a grass legume mixture, uh, even if it's of one legume and one grass. Um, usually that combination is important. Uh, and, and in a climate like we have in Vermont, I think it helps to spread the risks of winter injury, uh, where you still are going to maintain some viable forage in that stand. Uh, the benefits of the grass, of course, are that they form the sod, uh, they have a, that their fibrous root systems are very good at extracting nutrients from the soil, um, and, uh, and they're very productive. The legumes uh, fix nitrogen, um, they usually increase the quality of the forage, um, especially higher protein content, and um, oftentimes they'll grow They'll be a little more productive in the summer compared to some of our fruits and grasses. Uh, these are, this is a picture of probably our major forage legumes. Um, and I'll just comment here, because I'm not going to spend any other time on the legumes. Uh, but if, um, if, uh, uh, if, you're gonna, if you're thinking of a hay crop and you have a well-drained uh, field, and certainly alfalfa, I think, is an excellent option. It's a crop with a deep taproot system, so it withstands uh, dry summers. Uh, it, uh, it's fairly flexible in cutting management uh, and, uh, it, and produces a high-quality uh, forage. Um, so I, I, I 
certainly would prefer an alfalfa grass mixture, again, on a soil that can support it. It does not do well in uh, poorly drained soils. Uh, in that case, probably for, again, for hay or haylage, uh, red clover would be uh, an excellent option to consider. Uh, our more suited uh, legume crop for, for poorly drained soils is bird's foot tree soil. I don't see this as often as I used to. Um, it's not quite as productive as red clover or alfalfa, but, um, but makes excellent uh, forage. Um, if you're considering pasture, uh, I think white clover is, is kind of the framework, the, the, the major legume that's going to be in a pasture mixture. Um, uh, very important. Um, with its uh, kind of spreading growth habit, its stoloniferous growth, um, it's much more tolerant to uh, close grazing and uh, uh, tends to be very supportive of the pasture system. If you're thinking of this field might be served as a combination pasture and hay, then I would lean toward a uh, tall ladino type white clover. Uh, these are the tallest of the white clovers, uh, generally are more productive and, and uh, a little more uh, suited for, for hay management than, than some of the uh, Dutch white, the, the shorter ones. So um, in choosing, I, I'm going to give some general thoughts on just picking forage varieties. It's not always easy. Uh, one, we have over a dozen species to think about, different grasses, different legumes. And then within those, there's all kind of varieties. And uh, if you start calling around seed companies, you get all kinds of opinions. So um, I, I've just got some general rules I like to go by first in trying to make these decisions. Um, first one is to know your farm and know what you need. So again, be familiar with your soils, you know, what's your forage quality goals. Um, and, and part of this is uh, so you can make those decisions, but also communicate that with your seed dealer um, as you uh, try to choose a variety. Um, as you talk to folks that are knowledgeable, and, and certainly your seed dealer should be knowledgeable, you know, ask lots of questions. You know, really force your dealer to be knowledgeable. Um, are, the, uh, are the mixtures that they're offering really suited for, for your climate and your soils? Um, ask for documentation. Um, ask if they have any research results of their mixtures or some of the varieties in their mixtures. Um, and look for data from objective evaluations. Um, uh, take a look at what they offer. Sometimes you can find data on those specific varieties from variety trials. Um, we just, we're in the third year of a pasture mixture trial here in Vermont. Um, that data is, has not been uh, posted yet. Uh, I was waiting for this third year. Um, but there's also data from New York State, uh, from University of Wisconsin, where they do uh, routine variety trials of many of these different grasses and legumes. Um, one point I really want to make is to avoid as much as possible any common uh, varieties, or it may state variety not stated on the seed tag. Uh, these are then just uh, non-named common varieties, and you really don't know what you're getting when you purchase that. Um, it may be fine, but there is a chance that um, there'll be unsuitable varieties. And I'll comment more on that on the next slide. Uh, again, when you look at the seed tag, check um, for your blends and mixtures for the variety names. And certainly be wary of any wildly optimistic claims, which sometimes we hear. So um, what is certified seed? Uh, you may hear that all the time, that you should buy certified seed. And that's a, a process usually regulated through individual states. Um, 
that assures that the seed you're buying is of the variety that's named on the seed tag, that it's a clean seed and that the seed is of high quality in terms of its viability and ability to germinate. So it really carries the reputation of the supplier, the seed producer, and the plant breeder. Um, so most of the certification occurs in those states that produce our forage seed. Most of our grasses are produced in Oregon, uh, some in Washington state, and, and many of our legumes are also produced in, in the West, either California, Oregon, Idaho, or Washington. So uh, these states all maintain a certification, um, uh, uh, a certification process. Um, you may not, you may look on a seed tag of a mixture and it may not mention whether it's certified or not. So what's important has been, you, you, it's always good to contact your seed dealer um, and just ask them. If they're a reputable dealer, then they're always looking for, I, I think, looking for varieties, one, that are suited for our climate and soils here and two that are from reputable companies. And uh, so it's good to talk to them and, and just uh, get a sense of that. Common seed, or varieties not stated, um, they may come from a named variety, but oftentimes uh, they're downgraded to a lower price because they could not meet certification standards. Um, and uh, so you are going to get a substandard uh, seed that way. Um, and again, sometimes you buy a mixture that has some certified seed and maybe some common seed, and you just have to make a judgment call. When we talk about some of the grasses, I'll, I'll make a few more references about this, some, some things to avoid. <clears throat> just uh, to clarify some definitions, um, we oftentimes use the word mixture. You'll also hear the word blend or brand, and, and so I just want to be clear. Mixtures really means two or more forage species. So it could be uh, an orchard grass and alfalfa mixture, uh, very simple, or it could be a very complex mixture of three, four, or five species. A blend is two or more varieties or cultivar of a single species, and uh, sometimes you'll see blends within a mixture. Um, uh, both of them uh, you'll oftentimes find, and, and both can be uh, advantageous. Um, why mixtures? I, I think there's some good reasons. Certainly one is that many of our fields vary in soil type uh, and in um, slope, and sometimes we have uh, poorly drained areas of our field and droughty areas in, all in the same field. So mixtures tend to um, I think uh, spread our risks uh, across that field and uh, provide us a more stable forage product. Um, again, I think adding a legume, uh, I've already mentioned, uh, increases quality and, and uh, nitrogen fertility ability. Um, so I think mixtures make sense, certainly in, in our climate here. Brand is the name uh, associated with a particular company's mixture or blend. Many companies will, will give a brand name, a trademark brand name for a particular mixture. Um, one point I want to make is oftentimes those brand names may stick around for a while, but the composition of that brand can change from year to year. Uh, you really have to look at the seed tag. So if you have a neighbor that was really happy with, uh, let's say, some brand, you know, Dairy Plus brand by a company, um, and you buy seed the next year, it may have changed somewhat. I, they don't change dramatically, but they do change uh, oftentimes, especially the varieties within those. So uh, um, it, it's just something to keep in mind. This is just an example of a, of a seed tag, it's one that I've made up, it's something you might see, and I just want to put it on to point out that when you look at a seed tag, um, 
there's a few things that are important to consider. Uh, purity is is the um, that is the percent by weight of each variety um, in that particular mix. So in this case, your Shade Master, which is the variety of red clover, um, is 20.5 percent of that seed. So uh, and that would be by weight. Um, so all the all the percentages in purity should add up close to 100 percent. Your germination is the percent of that seed, which uh, which will uh, will germinate, or at least that was the the basis from a germination test done in a seed lab. And you can always look on the seed tag. There should be a test date when that germination test was conducted. Um, and if it's a couple of years old, or even a year old, uh, like in this seed tag then um, it's good to uh, request that the test be remade, redone. Uh, seed will lose their viability um, over time, uh, depending much on how the seed is stored. Um, but certainly when, if, when you buy seed, if the test date is, is a year old, you should raise questions about that. Okay. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but but be aware that if you're when you're buying mixtures, um, the the legume component, the legume seed, really needs to be inoculated uh, with the proper strain of nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, and uh, uh, there are different uh, cross inoculation groups. The most common are alfalfa and clovers. Oftentimes, you can buy inoculant that has a mixture of those two uh, in them. And uh, so uh, um, you can, um, uh, uh, you know, use just one inoculant for, for both types. I'm going to skip this one because I think the next one makes the same point. Uh, when you buy seed that comes pre-inoculated, uh, find out how it was stored and make sure it's stored in a nice, cool environment. Uh, direct sunlight or any hot, drying conditions can be detrimental to the uh, bacterial inoculant. So you really want to store any bags, of, little bags of inoculant in the refrigerator uh, after you purchase it. And, um, and if you buy seed that's pre-inoculated, uh, look at the expiration date. If it's really way past the date, you may want to just go ahead and buy a bag of inoculant and inoculate the seed before you plant. Uh, this is just a pitch close-up of a seed mix. Sometimes the legume seed come coated. This is a lime coating that has the inoculant mixed in with the coating. Um, and, and they're very effective and work quite well. It's really more a matter of this um, this time phase, and if you you know if you always if you have a question about it, you can certainly always ask your seed dealer about that to get their opinion. Okay, from an agronomic perspective, uh, one of the major factors that may influence which species is going to do best in your field is is how well they're adapted to soil drainage. Uh, this table. Uh, just shows the variation in in an adaptation of the of the more common forage species uh, for dr soil drainage classes. So this is a very simple table. Um, we probably have about six or seven different specific soil drainage classes. But from dry to wet, we certainly know alfalfa tolerates dry. It does not tolerate wet. Uh, some grasses, like reed canary grass, has a wide range of adaptation. Um, others are more suited for medium to wet. So it, again, if, when we're formulating a mix, uh, think about what kind of field you have and which would be most suited. And um, I'm going to end this little section with um, that uh, there, I do have a publication on my website which just is a simple table of the major forages and, 
in what they're generally, their adaptation for different conditions. Um, if you want to uh, download that, um, I'm going to just show you, I think at this point, uh, if I can get it here. Um, uh, let's see. Let me find it. I never remember my own URL. Okay, this this is a website I maintain, um, and it's a U, if you type in uvm.edu slash pss slash vt crops, um, you'll get the Vermont Crops and Soils web page. And over on your left are some menus, and under that are hay and haylage crops or pasture and grazing. And um, you can look up species and varieties. And the table I was talking about is this characteristics of forage and pasture species. And it's a PDF. So um, you can get that from that web page. There's also, while I'm here, a couple of PDFs for forage identification. Um, well, one is a link to a really nice site that Purdue has. Um, I'm not going to click on it now, but just so you'll be aware of it. And uh, there's also a PowerPoint presentation on forage plant identification. I don't think it works on this webinar site, so I'm not going to click on it here. And then there's a couple of publications I've put together, one for legume and one for grasses that you can download uh, to get more detailed information. Okay. We will go back to our presentation if I can remember how to do that. <laughs> Did you just need to close the window, I think? Oh, OK. There, there we go. go. OK. So at this point, um, uh, we from, from here on, we're going to talk about a little more specifically about many of the grasses you might choose from, and then continue on our discussion of uh, seedbed uh, preparation and seeding down. But up to this point, is there any questions about seed selection uh, that we've talked about so far? If you have any, if you want to uh, fire away any uh, comments, that'd be great. Okay, no questions. We will move on. Okay, choosing your grasses. I, I, I just want to do a quick rundown of the major grasses that uh, at least we grow in, um, in New England. And uh, so some of this is, uh, I will readily admit, is, is my bias based on my experience with them. Okay, let's start with a really popular one, orchard grass. Uh, this is a bunch grass, which means it, uh, it does not, it, it, it grows in a bunch. It's not a sod forming grass, so it doesn't send out side shoots, uh, rhizomes or stolons. Uh, all the growth comes up out of the crown of the mother plant. And uh, it can actually get pretty, uh, that crown, that, that bunch can get pretty wide with orchard grass. Uh, it's a prolific tillering grass. And the tiller is each one of these little grass units, um, a new one being produced from that crown. And uh, so it, it really produces very deep, extensive roots. And this grass uh, does pretty well in dry weather um, through, through the summer. So it's a very productive grass. Um, tolerates early, frequent cutting, um, and uh, grows pretty well with, with most of our major legumes. Um, it, 
if you're selecting a variety, if orchard grass is going to be part of either your hay mix or your pasture mix, two things you might ask your seed dealer about. Um, there, there's four different kind of growth habit types of orchard grass uh, that's been developed. You've got tall, stemmy, early producing uh, orchard grass uh, varieties. Um, as a general rule, the earlier uh, productive grasses, the ones that head out the earliest, tend to be the most productive, the highest yielding. So if you're if you're chopping haylage and you've got good soils and you can really get out there on time and make your cuts, um, that first one might be to your advantage if, if yield is your primary goal. Uh, there's also tall, leafy, late heading varieties. Um, these may not be quite as high a yielding, but if for its quality is your goal, then that's probably going to be a better choice for uh, hay or haylage management. Um, there's also medium tall, leafy, medium late varieties. Um, and these may be suited for combination pasture and hay management um, because they will be uh, kind of a compromise between productivity and, and uh, quality. And then uh, there are some newer varieties that are really uh, meeting some of the pasture needs that are more dwarf, leafy, medium late varieties. Um, so they, they tend to grow a little bit lower. They're a, a little more tolerant to uh, close grazing. And um, so again, they're not as high a yielding under hay management, but can be quite productive under uh, pasture management. The one caution I would give, I've seen a few of these varieties advertised. I evaluated one of these varieties in my pasture mixture trial. It, um, it came from New Zealand. And uh, to be quite honest, it didn't do well in our trial under our conditions. So uh, that's one thing to think about when you're selecting varieties. There's something to ask your seed dealers. Where were these varieties developed? Um, under what conditions. Uh, there's some great material from New Zealand. I just don't know how suited they are for our conditions in, in Vermont uh, or New England. Um, I prefer to look at what's being developed uh, out of Europe. Uh, but even then, you uh, need to ask um, some tough questions sometimes to the seed dealer. This is a uh, just a kind of a graph showing the relative difference in hardiness uh, from most hardy to least hardy of, of, again, some of our more common forage grasses. And I want to just make the point here that orchard grass seems to be on the low end of this chart. Now, I've lived here for 20 years, and generally, any experience I've had with orchard grass is that it goes through the winters just fine and uh, comes out of the winters just fine. But again, on a relative basis, it is somewhat less winter hardy than some of these other grasses. And I, again, I just want to emphasize that um, that makes it even more, we need to be even more careful when we're selecting varieties um, in terms of where they were developed. One other consideration with orchard grass in selecting varieties is um, their relative maturity. And this is one of the grasses that has a very wide range of early heading to, and, and this really late, late heading for orchard grass or medium heading. There can be a two to three week difference in varieties uh, in, in this range. And as a general rule, you want a medium to late heading variety um, so that by the time we have the weather to actually make hay, um, the variety hasn't totally gone by with quality, um, that it's, uh, it's still in a, a medium head stage. One concern with common varieties, if you buy a common no named orchard grass variety, chances are real good it's an early 
maturing variety. Uh, the seed producers out in Oregon will get a higher seed yield from an early maturing grass than a late maturing grass. So if they're going to grow a common variety, their main profit is from yield. Uh, they're not, certainly not going to get a premium for it. So you can almost bet that any common varieties of orchard grass are in this early maturing uh, stage. Um, so it definitely is best to buy a, uh, a certified named variety of orchard grass. Okay, moving on. Timothy uh, is one that you may consider. It's very winter hardy, one of our most winter hardy grasses. Uh, for hay, it heads out later than other grasses, so it, it certainly can be suited for, for hay management. And it does pretty well in wet area, wet soils. Um, one of its downsides, I think, is that it has, tends to have a shallow root system. Um, uh, I, I've got this little comment that about 80% of the root mass is in the top um, couple of inches of the soil surface. So when we get into hot, dry summers, it really does not grow well compared to some of the other grasses, which uh, is probably the downside. Uh, but if you're trying to grow a, a two-cut system of hay, uh, you know, Timothy's a, a really good option to, to consider. And, it, and it's very compatible with, with many of our legumes. Uh, another one that I think is very compatible with our legumes and is very suited for a, uh, let's say, a two-cut hay system is smooth brome grass. Um, it's a sod-forming grass, very deep roots. So it does well in dry weather and uh, makes a really nice palatable hay. Um, again, it's a sod forming. Uh, it's got these nice extensive rhizomes. Um, and uh, w one thing about smooth brome grass, uh, both it and Timothy, they're not tolerant of frequent cutting uh, or, or grazing. So if they're if they're cut too early, too often, uh, it'll really hurt their stand, and, and that's why I say they're really most suited, I think, for hay management and for uh, a, a more simple two-cut system. I know I'm going through quickly, but I want to make sure to get back to the seeding uh, before our session is up here. Uh, Tall fescue is gaining more popularity, I think, in Vermont, especially amongst uh, haylage producers. Um, this is a grass relatively new to us. Um, it's a bunch grass. It's adapted to many different soil uh, conditions. And um, so I do want to make a couple comments. Um, I think for grazing, um, it's not as palatable as other grasses. And we're finding that when in a mixture with other species, animals will prefer the other species and they'll leave it alone. So I'm not sure if it's really suited for pasture mixtures. Uh, where I've seen it very useful is when it's grown primarily alone or maybe just with one legume, red clover or white clover. Um, and then it's used for stockpiling. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, uh, the uh, forages, the animals are taken off, let's say, in August, and the forage, the grass is just allowed to accumulate in growth until mid to late fall. Uh, fescue leaves hold their integrity quite well through frosts, so uh, it will hold up and, and um, actually accumulate sugars pretty well and provides a pretty decent uh, forage for uh, especially maintenance animals or, or uh, dry cows <coughs> as a way of deferring grazing into late fall. But again, the leaves are very coarse, not as palatable uh, when in mixtures. And I think what you'll find is that it will increase in, in composition while the others go down if it's in a mixture because the animals just aren't eating it as, as relative as much. Uh, some companies have come out with some new traits. One is called soft leaf. Um, and I, um, 
it, it's a relative thing, but the, the leaves have been bred to be a little softer and therefore more palatable. And I think we're just gaining information on this. Um, and, and it's one of those things you may have to experiment on your own with. Uh, there's really very little information out there. You may have read about the endophyte uh, in tall fescue. Uh, this is a fun fungus that grows inside the plant. And uh, several years ago, it was discovered that this endophyte, um, it, it actually gives the grass many benefits, but it does cause uh, toxicity problems to animals that are grazing it. Um, oftentimes, they'll have poor performance, uh, reproductive problems. Um, elevated temperatures, um, and so uh, it, it's really been a, an issue with this grass through the years. Um, basically, this endophyte produces an alkaloid, it's called ergovalene, and it causes vasoconstriction in the blood vessels, uh, which leads to many of these symptoms. And, and like I said, the, the advantages, though, of this endophyte in tall fescue is that uh, these grasses uh, establish better. They're more vigorous. Um, they resist pests. Um, they're more tolerant of abuse and drought. And they're more persistent when they have this association with the endophyte. And um, so it's been an interesting 20, 30 years since all this was discovered. Uh, the seed industry responded in two ways. Um, the syndophyte only spreads through the seed. It only translocates within the seed, and you can actually kill it in the seed, and therefore you have endophyte-free or low endophyte seed that is oftentimes sold. So you can buy this low endophyte uh, varieties uh, to eliminate those animal problems. Um, in our climate here, that's probably fine. It's a good thing to do. Uh, as you move further south in the more uh, fescue belt, such as Virginia and Kentucky, um, their summers are hot enough and dry enough that, that this is creating a problem. They're not, their stands are not as persistent as they used to be uh, when they use these low in the fight lines. Uh, I don't think that's an issue here in, in, in our, with our climate, though. So I would still recommend uh, low endophyte lines of tall fescue. Um, one thing to watch out for is the seed industry also sells high endophyte tall fescue. And uh, many of our so-called conservation mixes will have high endophyte tall fescue in it. And if, uh, if you're seeding down a small area for your backyard horses, uh, be careful what you're seeding. Uh, it may have a mixture with, with one of these um, varieties. Some seed companies um, have put warnings on their seed tags if it has these endophytes. Um, and the reason is that uh, for turf grasses, which some of the turf grasses do include tall fescue, um, they want to add the endophyte. In fact, they call it endophyte enhanced because it gives all those agronomic benefits to the tall fescue. Um, so watch out for that if, if uh, you're uh, seeding down just a small mixture for your backyard horses. Um, you certainly want to avoid any um, endophyte in those mixes. I'm going to skip this one. It's, it's in that handout. It's just, it's a more winter hardy type of fescue. Uh, at this point, the jury's still out on this one. We may hear more about this later. Uh, but it is a type of fescue, kind of like tall fescue, a little more palatable. Uh, but at this point, there's very little available. So I'm going to move on. Uh, I've got a couple more grasses to talk about. The ryegrass group, um, I consists of several different um, species and types. Uh, we have perennial ryegrass, Italian, sometimes we call that annual ryegrass. Intermediate is, is a hybrid of these two. And then a newer one called Festulolium. 
And all of these are usually considered higher in quality uh, and I would say are particularly suited for pasture mixtures. Um, they're bunch grasses, so they grow out of a bunch rather than a sod. Biggest problem is they're not very winter hardy. And so you can see them decline rapidly in stands um, in our uh, climate here in, in the Northeast. Uh, one of the advantages of the ryegrasses is that they germinate quickly. And uh, this picture illustrates, this was a side-by-side -side comparison of bluegrass, ryegrass, and tall fescue. And the ryegrass was up within four or five days, the seedlings were up, where the bluegrass took about two and a half weeks. Fescue was up somewhere in between those two. So if you have a pasture mixture and you want to get quick cover, then there is an advantage of having some ryegrass in that mixture, whether that be perennial ryegrass, Italian ryegrass, or the festulolium. If you're going to uh, grow perennial ryegrasses, generally we plant tetraboid varieties. These are larger more suited for both pasture and perhaps hay. The diploid are smaller, they're more winter hardy, they tend to be turf types, and they're much finer leaf and, and smaller in, in stature. So these are much more suited for, for uh, harvesting by the animal. And just a comment on Italian, generally we treat this like an annual. Uh, ryegrass. They're bigger, much bigger than perennial ryegrass. And uh, there are different cultivars or varieties, and some of them will persist for more than a year. I've seen a very successful stand um, in Huntington uh, where uh, the farm uses it for grazing, uh, finishing uh, beef animals. Produces a very high quality pasture that he uh, uh, rotationally grazes through. And it persisted for a couple of years under that situation. The last of these is Festulolium. And this is a cross between ryegrass and fescue. And it could be between Italian ryegrass and meadow fescue or perennial ryegrass and tall fescue, but it's between those types. So there's different varieties out there, and they really vary. Um, in, in um, how they grow and, and react to, especially to our climate. Uh, again, they are not as winter hardy. Um, we've evaluated five of them in Randolph over the last couple of years and uh, definitely have not shown, um, I have not been totally pleased. They, they definitely, some of them have shown a winter kill uh, and have, have definitely thinned down over, over time. Uh, but a little bit in a mix might be good just to, again, to get quick, uh, get it kind of kick-started and, and jumped early out of the gate to, uh, to help that stain get going. But, uh, but don't expect a lot out of this over, over the long haul. All right, I'm just, this is a picture from one of the plots of, this was the spring after a fall seeding of uh, one of the varieties of festulolium, and it really showed up in this study um, as not as winter hardy. Now, interestingly, that was dead, but some of it did grow up through that. It, it wasn't completely dead, and uh, we still are finding festulolium in these mixtures, um, but I wouldn't want to count on it as a major part of that mix. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, 20% of your mix might be festulolium. But you're really going to want to count on some of the other grasses to be there within the first two or three years. Um, this information um, uh, you can get from the handout of this talk, so I won't go into it. I just want to point out this column here. This is the percent of the festulolium the first year and the second year of the stand, and we're just now collecting for the third year. But you can see that for these four varieties, um, actually this one winter killed after the first year, they really dropped dramatically from uh, 89 to 18 percent, 59 to 9, 
78 to 10 percent. So um, I think the jury's still out on these uh, on this grass. Um, this graph shows um, this mixture over time in that study in Randolph. Just to illustrate, when we first seeded it, the Festulolium really took off. And this is the spring of the next year. We seeded in the in the fall or, or you know in, in late summer. And this is the percent of Festulolium of all the mixtures. And you can see over that first year it really dropped and then kind of leveled off. Now I think what we're finding this year is it's still there and it's just at a more stable, stable phase. Interestingly, just look at the white clover. This was seeded also and by the end of the first year it had really moved up to about 40 percent of the stand by dry matter weight and really has remained stable. Um, a very important uh, resource for your pasture. One other aspect of Festulolium and Italian ryegrass, many of them, even after you graze two or three times, will send up seed head throughout the season. And um, I, I'm not, you know, it, it, that certainly has an impact on quality, even though there's still a lot of high quality leaves in the stand. Um, we do get these, these uh, seed stalks coming up. I'm not quite sure how that affects quality overall. Reed canary grass. I think this, I think it's, this is the last grass. Um, very adapted to our wet soils, very productive. Um, it's tricky to graze. It produces stubble. The animals don't always want to uh, graze. My only point is if you've got a well-drained soil that can support alfalfa, this is a good grass that's compatible with alfalfa when grown on those type of soils. But if it's a wet soil, it will take over and really dominate. Uh, but when grown with alfalfa on a well-drained soil, it's a nice mix. Uh, it doesn't compete, out-compete the alfalfa, especially if you're on a three-cut system. Um, it, it does pretty well. Otherwise, uh, it, it's, it's a tough one to make hay off of because it's on wet soils and you can't cut it until really late. And it's uh, not always easy to graze. If you're going to seed it, though, most of the varieties out there are uh, called low alkaloid varieties, which means they, they're more palatable. The, these, al these alkaloids really cause uh, high alkaloid lights would cause a palatability problem. Uh, the animals just wouldn't want to graze it. And we do have several varieties now that are low alkaloid that are available. And then last is, is Kentucky bluegrass. Um, this is a smaller stature grass. Uh, sometimes I've heard it referred to as June grass, I guess because it heads out in June. Um, it's low growing. The advantage for this grass at a pasture mixture is that it does, it's sod farming. Uh, it's got uh, short extensive rhizomes. But it's shallow rooted, so it's not, um, uh, very, uh, you know, it really dries out in the summertime. Here's a picture of the rhizomes. So I wouldn't count on it as the major grass in a pasture mix, but if it was 10% of your seed, that may be okay. Um, there's not many varieties of bluegrass uh, suited for pasture production. Most of the bluegrasses are for turf. Um, but uh, check with your dealer. I know Troy is one variety that's been used in the past. It's a, a taller, more upright variety. And there may be a few more out there now uh, that the seed industry uh, has come out with. OK. Um, I'm going to skip through these for sake of time. Uh, is there any questions at this point? OK, I see one. Uh, can the endophyte be picked up after it is seeded from native soils? 
Um, that's a good question. Um, the endophyte only stays inside the plant. So the only way it could get into your field is if contaminated seed gets into your field. Um, I've seen that happen. Uh, I've seen pastures that are adjacent to roadsides um, that suddenly get, uh, over time, uh, invaded with tall fescue. Uh, probably originally the, the roadside was seeded uh, with some kind of conservation mix that had tall fescue in it. Um, but uh, you aren't going to, you, you will not get uh, infection from the soil itself. It's got to come from the plant. Um, recommendations for specific animals. Um, again, the, the endophyte is a concern, especially if you have uh, uh, horses and especially if you have breeding horses. Pregnant mares are very uh, sensitive to that and um, in something to really be cautious of. Otherwise, um, I think most animals, uh, most, you know, most ruminants uh, can do fine on, on any of these forages if managed properly. Certainly the different animal species will graze in different ways. Um, some of the low growing types might be more suited for close grazing animals. Um, such as sheep, but but by and large, under you know, I think it's your it's your pasture management that's going to dictate how these species do, um, just about as much as the animals themselves. Jesse, how's my time? Well, we were hoping to wrap up about now. Uh oh. <laughs> um, uh, it's about eight o'clock now, but I know that you were going to. Uh, maybe you can go quickly through the seedbed preparation and uh, post seeding uh, uh, maintenance. Um, maybe in the, over the next 15 minutes. Yep, I can do that. I, I would like to cover a few things on seedbed preparation because um, I do believe that seedbed is it's much more important. The preparation uh, for a seed bed is much more important for forage seed than, than certainly grains because they're they're so much smaller, and um, so uh, I think having the right seed bed is really important to assure a good stand. And and so these principles I think will apply whether uh, regardless of the the type of seeding method you're using. Um, so when we think about tillage, certainly primary tillage could be conventional, in other words, with a moldboard plow followed by some kind of harrowing. Um, uh, we also have seen successful stands with no-till, using no-till drills, or with minimum till, uh, where you might be using a chisel plow in combination with, with harrowing to prepare the site. Um, and, then, and then for more conventional seeding, I think secondary tillage is very important to get the proper seed bed. So I'm going to start with a few comments on conventional uh, seed bed preparation. And I like to use this picture because this is a, a, a good goal to shoot for when preparing that site. And that is if you can stand on that site and if your foot imprint sinks half, a half an inch or more, then you need to go back and do something else. It's, that, that site is not quite ready. It's too fluffy and you're going to have problems with the forage seeding. You really want this seed bed to be fine, firm, and smooth um, to support these uh, forage seedings. Um, and the reason is that uh, if it's too fluffy, and I think I've got a picture here, yeah, if it's too fluffy then um, you're not going to get a good soil to seed contact and, and you're not going to get enough moisture around that seed to support germination. If it's too cloddy, then a lot of the seed may fall down and, and get seeded too deep. Uh, and again, there could be poor soil to seed contact. So you really want to take uh, a seed bed and, and try to um, leave it where it's nice and firm on top. Um, in a sense, you're going to have surface compaction. We're not talking about compaction that, that um, 
suppresses the roots as we develop it, but just good um, surface compaction to get good seed to soil contact. I just can't emphasize that enough. Um, so in that final tillage, if you have an implement that can break up the clods, um, can firm up the soil, that, that then is a good seed bed to, uh, to seed into. And I like to recommend that you use some kind of cultivator both before and after planting to, uh, to try to assure this, this, uh, this type of seed bed. Um, remember, these seeds are very small, so um, anything to help them along is going to be critical. Um, there's certainly many ways, well, there's two major ways to seed, uh, forage seed. Um, but probably the most common is the broadcast method. And I mean broadcast where the seed is uh, put out in a broadcast manner. Now this first picture is a, is a brilliant cultipack seeder. And in essence, that is a broadcast method. The seed is dropped onto these two corrugated rollers in between. The first one passes and puts just very narrow um, corrugations. The seed drops through, and then the, the last one is staggered so that the seed ends up kind of a mix of planted very shallow uh, and then almost at the surface. Uh, but it leaves a nice firm seed bed with that seed really pressed into the soil. Um, and usually can do a pretty good job. But, um, there are other ways, of, though, of broadcast seeding. Some farmers really like to hire this done. They'll prepare the site, but then uh, some companies offer what they call, uh, uh, well, you can have suspension seeding or air seeding where it's sprayed onto the field. So if you have a large acreage, um, there's an advantage. You can cover a lot of ground very rapidly with this method. Um, another broadcast method is using a grain drill with raised tubes where with splash plates. So the, the uh, seed is metered out basically by the grain drill, but it's hitting splash plates and scattering across the field. And I would emphasize that if you use either one of these methods, well, the last being spinning it off with a spinner spreader, and if you use any of these last three, you still want to follow it up with some kind of cultipacker to firm the soil. Um, you know, here's a spinner spreader. Or if it's a really small field, um, and I've done this with an acre site, and that is to spin it on with, with one of these shoulder-mounted uh, spinners, um, which uh, can, can, can be done pretty quickly if it's just a very small area. Again, the, the, my, I, I can't emphasize enough, though, that these are just methods to get it distributed. You still want to make sure that seed bed is uh, properly fitted to support the seed. The other major method is band seeding, and that involves planting your forage in some kind of rows, uh, usually using a drill. So it's a narrow row, six, six inches wide, usually. Um, and I think the critical aspect that you see in this picture is that um, it has press wheels to really firm the soil after the seed is, is placed. The advantage of a drill is you can more accurately uh, uh, seed at the, the, the depth that you desire. Uh, in other words, seed placement. Um, if you do this, you want, to, you want a drill that has a small seed box to properly meter your seed. And, and if you can, if it had a fertilizer box that can place um, a small and out, uh, a band of fertilizer down and away from the seed, um, that can act as a good starter. Uh, a lot of drills don't have that feature, at least that I've seen. Uh, but band seeding um, uh, can certainly place the seed and firm the seed um, and, uh, and be of a benefit. Uh, uh, just another picture of a drain drill. Uh, I can't, you know, the real key here is the press wheels to uh, firm up that seed after it's seeded. 
Okay. Um, these plots that I have were seeded with a special small plot seeder, but it really does plant in a, in a band. You can see the rows uh, of the seed. And you might think, well, you really want to broadcast to get a good even distribution. But if it's seeded in uh, six inch or less rows, these fill in pretty rapidly. Uh, these are the same plots the following spring, uh, the first grazing, um, or right before the first grazing we were sampling. So, um, uh, you know, as long as the band is six inches or narrow, there's really not an issue about uh, getting any kind of yield drag. And then there is no-till seeding, and I, I don't have time to go into it. It has its own special niche, um, but can be very effective. Same principles, though. You want a drill that's going to place the seed uh, in, the, in the soil and then firm the soil around that seed so it gets good seed-to-soil contact. Um, so with no-till drilling, it takes a little more care to make sure you get that or you achieve that goal. Um, I have this picture because one form of no-till drilling is, is frost seeding, but that's not our topic tonight. So um, we will move on. Uh, a little bit on seeding depth. Uh, in the fall, if uh, it gets dry, this can be critical. Uh, brilliance do not control depth. It's really near the surface. But with a drill, you can control the depth. And Usually you want that seed to be a quarter to a half inch deep. If it's a sandy soil uh, and it's a little bit on the dry side, just, you know, maybe three quarters, but certainly no more than one inch. Um, and usually, again, a quarter to a half inch is, is critical. These are small seeds, so if they're too deep, it just takes too much energy for the shoots to get up. Um, to the soil surface. And for seeding rates, um, um, certainly if you're buying a pasture mixture or a brand, um, uh, you know, you can go by the, the seed company's recommendations. Um, these are kind of the goals. It, most hay crop seedings run between 8 and 20 pounds per acre for a, a, a mixture. Uh, pasture seedings anywhere from 15 to 25 pounds. Uh, all our plots on our mixtures were seeded at a 25 pound per acre rate. And that gave a pretty decent stand um, for that mixture. <clears throat> I'm going to um, stop at this point, see if there's any other questions. Um, I think you can read about my starter fertilizer uh, recommendations. and. And that's really it. For a late summer seeding, there's really not much post-harvest other than normally we don't, you, you stay off of it. I wouldn't put animals on, um, you know, let the seeds, uh, let the seedlings get established. The only uh, factor I would say there is um, uh, in some of our pasture mixtures where festulolium was dominant, it really took off in the fall. It loves the fall season. And uh, it got as tall as uh, 8 to 10 inches uh, by late fall. And, and in that case, um, it might be good to either mow it off or graze it off, get it clipped down a little bit. Otherwise, it can fall over and kind of smother um, the stand uh, through the winter months and, and possibly give you a little bit of winter kill. But normally, you would. Um, uh, let that stand go until the next year. And uh, that is it for my presentation. If there's any other questions, maybe we have a minute to wrap this up. All right. Thank you for attending. Jesse, I'll turn it back over to you.
Thanks very much, Sid, for being with us this evening. And um, I will send follow-up uh, information. William, if you wanted to put your email address in, um, I can send you follow-up information. And this will also be posted on our website, uh, a link to the recording, and also a PDF file of this presentation. So thanks a lot, and uh, everybody have a good evening. OK. Have a good night.